Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Joy Pirates. I'm the priest here at St. Clement's. And it is truly a gift to spend this time with all of you as we celebrate the life of Deborah Claire Shando. In just a moment, we'll begin with some remembrances. After the remembrances, worship will begin with our opening anthem, at which time we invite you to stand as able. Please know that you are welcome to fully participate in today's service. Everything you need is in your white bulletin and in the hymnal, which is in the pew rack in front of you. Please know that the prayers of this entire community are with all of you, Shambo and Mueller families, as you read. And now I invite a time of remembrance for those who have written those remembrances. On behalf of Douglas and the Mueller's, we want to thank you for coming to this service. Mom, you made it. I'm Todd Mueller, one of the nine Mueller siblings. It's surreal that in just over a month's time, we've gone from the joyful, emotional high of our son's wedding to the enormous gut-wrenching low of losing our oldest sister. My earliest memory of death goes back to 1959 when as seven and eight-year-olds we traveled with Grandma Nani to visit our aunt in New York City. Aunt Carol had tickets for a Broadway play which she had assured my mom was suitable for children. <laughs> Deb and I were mesmerized by the show, especially a nightclub scene with a dozen scantily clad ladies, dancing girls. When we returned home, Deb wanted to share that scene with the family. <laughs> so here she comes, this precocious eight-year-old, sashaying down the stairs, singing in her best nasally voice, Fan Tan Fanny kept waving her fan. <laughs> Perhaps it was that trip to Broadway that got Deb interested in drama. She was a natural on the stage. I remember going to see her perform at Archbishop Murray High School and was truly amazed as to her real talent. Deb was artistic. She started a greeting card business called the Shambles Papari, made with vintage images. One day I walked into a gift shop in Shoreview and saw her products on display. I proudly told the clerk that Deb was my sister. Oh, she smiled. We just love Deb's work. Debbie was a brilliant person. She worked in the medical profession for decades, and her knowledge of the system was especially put to use for the family when she managed mom's complex doctor and medical bills. Deb knew mom's caregivers well and worked hard to maintain supportive relationships through these stressful COVID days. Yet she could be a pit bull when necessary. Case in point, one steamy August night, when the air conditioning system at my mom's assisted living center was not working, and the rooms were hot and very uncomfortable. After many hours of fruitlessly waiting for management to get a repairman, Deb had had enough, and made a call to a guy she knew who just happened to work for Ranch County Sheriff Bob Fletcher. <laughs> Within 30 minutes, a deputy showed up with a squad car full of fans. <laughs> Without Deb's tenacity and resolve, that just wouldn't have happened. Deb had a great love of classical music. When her condition worsened and she was greatly sedated, Doug played her a recording of Bach's first Brandenburg concerto. Doug's text to the family read, when that busy, joyful first movement began, her eyes went wide open and she looked up at me. 
Doug, in just two days, you would have celebrated your 25th anniversary with Deb. Through those years, you have been a selfless and supportive husband to your wife, who loved you and who you love more than life itself. As Doug said, now I have my own saint and angel to call on in heaven. God bless you. Doug's, Deb's youngest brother, Dan, eight out of nine. In her 30s, Deb immersed herself in the choral tradition of the Twin Cities. She loved that voices united in song could create powerful, compelling moments. She listened to choral music incessantly. She learned how to sight read demanding music, which she had not known how to do. She was so into it that she developed a belief that there were two types of people in this world, and singing in a choir was better than both of them. <laughs> For some reason, I found Deb persuasive. And when I returned to the cities after graduating from college, Deb recruited me into singing for our parish choir, which was headed up by Minnesota choral treasurer, Ted Gillen. Deb said, we need a tenor. I said, I asked, how many do you have now? She said, one, and I'm it. <laughs> okay, that didn't exactly persuade me, but somehow I said yes. And the next thing I knew, I was in the rehearsal room singing tenor next to my sister. It was a riot. When one of us made a mistake, we'd elbow each other into an argument. Every once in a while, when we had to sing a really low note, I'd look over at her in disbelief that that note just came out of my sister. <laughs> and she just looked at me and shrugged her shoulders. <laughs> if Deb was singing in your section, you wanted to be near her because she had this consistent ability to find the tenor's first note on the first try. Now, as I share this with you, it's important for you to know that we were not a good choir. <laughs> but we didn't quit and Deb made sure we all had fun. I like, I like to think of myself as a responsible person, but around Debbie, um, especially in choir practice, mischief ensued. It could not be helped. During one practice, Deb and I hatched a plan to get the bassist to join us in singing the Magnificat with a lisp, just to see if Ted would notice anything. The choir gets it. Because the Magnificat prayer goes, my soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Well, the bases were all in. We started the piece, and it was as if someone had blown a dog whistle that only Ted could hear. <laughs> he cocked his head, he looked quizzically at all of us, and he made us run through it again and again before we all busted up in laughter. At Deb's urging, Rehearsals were followed by visits to our favorite bar downtown, where the bartenders knew our name and even helped us recruit tenors to our growing choir. <laughs> One beautiful summer night, we closed the bar. We walked to the middle of Mears Park and we huddled up. Ted gave us our first notes and we gave our best shot at performing his Cantate Domino. As the last note echoed off the building surrounding the park, Deb and I just looked at each other. Before any of us could say anything, we heard the applause coming from a shocked police officer on the other side of the park. And that was the moment we knew we had gotten good. <laughs> I contend that the camaraderie that Deb brought to this choir was a huge part of accelerating our success. Eventually, it wasn't just our families coming to concerts, but now so were the bartenders. <laughs> A new opportunity took Deb to St. Louis, where she joined the choir at the Church of St. Michael and St. George. I went, th I went to their Thanksgiving service one year and mercilessly teased my sister Debbie, the patron saint of anyone crusading against anything unjust, that she now sang for a church that had valet parking. <laughs> the choir, however, was impeccable. They completed a recording uh, and a tour where Deb got to perform in glorious cathedrals around England, this time as an alto. 
She returned to St. Paul and she found her way into another fantastic choir right here at St. Clement's. And here it was that she met, courted, and married Douglas Shamba II, her choir director and another Minnesota choral treasure. Their wedding ceremony here remains one of the most charming weddings I have attended. The Italian composer Cesare Pavese says, we do not remember days, we remember moments. I am especially grateful that Deb pursued her choral passions because now I can also be grateful for all the moments of ridiculous mischief, for the moments that helped me find my starting, she helped me find my starting note, for all the moments spent lifting ourselves up through music, and for the moments that led my sister into a devoted, loving marriage. A brother could ask no more. Well, I'm Julie Mueller, oh, excuse me, and I am the ninth of nine. My sister Deb had a great sense of humor. At least once a year, I'd remind her how she took the four youngest kids to a nice documentary on sharks at the theater. <laughs> that documentary was a little movie called Jaws. <laughs> To this day, I love watching Jaws on the 4th of July. And she once had a job interview where she was asked, if you were a tree, what kind of a tree would you be? And she answered dryly, one that can type 90 words a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Deb. Deb was intelligent. She could teach herself anything and do it well, and she was also unapologetically honest and authentic, which was sometimes hard to take, but she didn't let a popular opinion get in the way of her belief system. She was an exceptional writer. Her letters to the editor of the Pioneer Press were cogent and well-crafted in her Facebook posts. Well, they were often provocative and evocative. And whether you agreed with her or not, she had her beliefs. And Deb was an involved citizen. She knew her po local politics and politicians well. Deb was on the Frogtown District Council where she won an award from George Latimer. Deb was passionate about the arts, as you know. She loved choral, classical, early music as much as she, as much as she loved Aretha. Deb was savvy with a dollar. Big Martha Stewart on a budget. That was Deb. She was generous with her time and generous with those in need, and before COVID and her health made her more reclusive. She was, and I, if I, it's funny that we both say this, she was a pit bull. Uh, she, was a, <laughs> she was a pit bull for the downtrodden. Um, Deb had the most eclectic group of friends made up uh, largely of people in the arts. And if you were lucky enough to be her friend, no doubt you've been to a party that she or she and Douglas threw. And I'm partial to the one where she and her roommate put an ad in the reader asking people to write to them and explain why they should be invited. <laughs> it's a great idea. They had a plethora of responses and the party was a riot. But that was Deb. You know, fun, creative, and she was a pie piper who brought people together. Um, Ten years ago, I had to retire because of my health. And Deb knew how strapped my partner Regina and I were so one winter evening, my partner uh, and I invited Deb and Douglas for dinner. They came over armed with carols, Christmas lights, and a large meat pack from Stasney's, her beloved shop. She said, you have to at least have some lights for Christmas. It touched us so much. She and Douglas always looked out for me. And when I was 19, I was going through some hard stuff and I was in desperate need of a place to stay for three months. Deb worked it out with her roommate and took me in. And no hesitation, 
when I was renting a house in Sweet Hollow, she learned that I hadn't put things up on my wall yet, nor had I decorated for Christmas. She came over, tossed off her sorrels and her jacket in a heap on the floor, and got busy decorating with me, and we had a riot. She gave me a tree with lights and other baubles, and that year, she and I hosted the family for a Christmas Eve, and it felt and looked magical. But what I will miss the most about my big sister is hearing her voice on the under, other end of the telephone line. With COVID, I seldom saw her, so we checked in on each other and talked on the phone almost daily. I always tried to get her to laugh. And with every one of my quirky, comical moments, I took particular delight in the retelling and the inevitable laughter from Deb. She was one of my most cherished friends. I don't yet, I don't yet know how I will get through the tragic loss, how my family will, or my mother, or most especially how her beloved Douglas will get through. But as my brother Scott told us, we carry those who, who die very, very dear and very close to our hearts and our minds. And it will take some time for our minds to catch up with our hearts. But in the meantime, I'm thankful that I have so many memories Deb to keep me smiling. I invite you to prayerful silence as the pallbearers assemble in the back of the church.
souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish, they seem to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and their going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, their hope is full of immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good, because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Those who trust in him will understand truth, and the faithful will abide with him in love, because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones, and he watches over his elect. Please join in reading responsibly Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where is my help to come? My help comes to the Lord, the maker of He will not let your foot be moved, and he who watches over you will not fall asleep. The Lord himself watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. So that the sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. It is He who shall keep you safe. The Lord shall watch over you from your house and your coming in, this time forth. Fall back in fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, 
when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. Who is to condemn? Is it Jesus Christ? Who died? Yes. Who was raised? Who was at the right hand of God? Who indeed intercedes for us? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God and Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. meditations of our hearts be ever acceptable in your sight, Christ our strength and our Redeemer. that eight-year-old girl 
standing forth boldly, ready to share the wonder of Broadway. <laughs> And that picture as well, Dad's encounter with God saying, well, I told you why I should be invited. I'm so glad I made the cut. This party is fantastic. <laughs> to which God then said, well, I let everybody come. <laughs> and the liveliness of your laughter speaks to the beauty and the truth of the memories that have been upheld today. Laughter and tears both. Because the truth of the matter is you can't actually celebrate the resurrection until after there's a death. You can't die until after you've lived. And that is the way of things. Life, death, and new life to come, one after the next and wholly dependent on the stage before. And so this is a day brought on by death, but it's also a feast of the resurrection, an Easter celebration during this Advent season of expectation. Life, death, and life again. Because death does not end our story. That is our faith. That is our hope that defies all reason. And that is God's promise to all of us through time and space. A promise made to our ancestors. A promise kept for us. A promise that will be for those yet to come. The promise that love will endure all things, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God. Even this, perhaps, especially this. Now, this does not mean that our tears, regrets, sorrows, and pain are inappropriate to this occasion. Rather, the grief we feel makes us kin to Christ, kin in a sacred fellowship of both joy and sorrow. We know that Jesus ate at table with his friends. We know that Jesus gathered in celebration of weddings. And we know that Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus. It is the love that we have for each other in Christ that brings such deep sorrow when we are parted by death. So our tears become the outward sign of an inward grace. Broken hearts writ on every face as we gather in grief, in grief and in hope, in grief and in Which brings me to the east-facing stained glass window in this space. When Doug and Julie and I met to discuss today, we gazed at it, taking a moment to take the beauty of that window in. A window that depicts Mary, the mother of Jesus, and the beloved disciple in grief at the foot of the cross. And today we stand with them because don't we understand their grief? Don't we understand how much it pains them? How much they hurt? Today we stand with them. But we also stand in the place where we know the part of the story that they have yet to hear. They don't know that that's not actually how it ends. The 
The moment at the cross was not the end of the story. And in this, we declare that this, this particular moment is not the end either. For love endures all things, even this, especially this. So we spoke of art, and we spoke of writing, and Doug shared with me that Deb was fond of Auden's poem, Funeral Blues. The poem itself is a lament. It's set within the context of deepest grief. And as I read the poem, it struck me as resonant with the image we observe above the altar. I can imagine Mary and the beloved disciple resonate with the poet's mournful yearning. It's a poem written from a place of despair and the speaker sees in death an end to love. It's a poem written for a moment when hope seems lost and pain seems vast. The stars are not wanted now. Put out every one, pack up the moon, and dismantle the sun. Everything stop. All movement, all noise, even the rhythm of creation itself. The world has been upended, and the rhythms of the sun and the moon even seem an insult to the devastation of death. But the poem, like the moment shared by Mary and the beloved disciples, is but a pause. We know that the clock has not stopped. We know that the sun and the moon will travel in their courses. We know. And so the irony of the poem seems akin to the irony of the east window. The words and the image reflect the right now. A moment bound by time, a particular day, a terrible hour. But we know more than the window or the poet suggest. We know more than the dreadful point in time. Because we know the love of God and that life will come, liberation will come, and Alleluia will be our song. Because the promise of God's love supersedes our temptation to despair. The hope we've been granted allows us to see beyond the now, through the window. Through the window. Into the what might be. What might be as we wait for the fullness of God's revelation? A revelation born of the God who loved us first. God, who got, called us good at our making. God, who watches over us and keeps us safe. God, who assures us that when the time comes, we will know the way. We'll know how to get there. We'll know the way. Because this is our God and we have been taught about what God's love looks like. And so as we follow that love, we find our place. Our place with God who holds us close in life and in death with the promise of all that is to come. This is our God. This is Deborah's God. And this is the truth. Love endures all things. It endures all things. From this place to the next, the love goes with us. The love we have in the here and the now, and the fullness of love that God has for us, ready and waiting 
so that we can take our moment on the stage amongst the saints, the angels, the archangels, that great company of heaven, with whom forever we shall sing. We shall sing in that place where we, like Deborah, will know the land of light and joy that has been promised. A promise that she has fully realized. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For our sister Deborah, let us pray to our Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am resurrection and I am life. Lord, you consoled Martha and Mary in their distress. Draw near to us who mourn for Deborah and dry the tears of those who weep. You wept at the grave of Lazarus, your friend. Comfort us in our sorrow. Hear us, Lord. You raised the dead to life. Give to our sister eternal life. Hear us, Lord. You promised paradise to the thief who repented. Bring your sister to the joys of heaven. Hear us, Lord. Our sister was washed in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Give her fellowship with all your saints. Hear us, Lord. She was nourished with your body and blood. Grant her a place at the table in your heavenly kingdom. Hear us, Lord. Comfort us in our sorrows at the death of our sister. Let our faith be our consolation and eternal life our hope. We thank you, O oh God, for the goodness and courage of passing the life of this year's servant, Deborah, into the lives of others, and have left the world richer for her presence. For our lives past faithfully and honorably discharged, for good humor and gracious affection and kindly generosity, for sadness met without surrender, and weakness endured without defeat. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. God of all, we pray to you for Deborah and for all those who we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. May her soul and the souls of all who pardon, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. May the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. We share with one another a sign of Christ's peace.
couple of things as we prepare for communion. Please know that all are welcome to receive. The ushers will assist in guiding you, but what will happen is we'll begin at the back. Folks will be invited to come forward with their masks on and receive the bread. And if you wish to receive the wine, we have small cups. You may take one and that will be filled from a common cruet. Please know that receiving in part is considered receiving in full, so you may take one or the other if you wish, or both. If you prefer to receive a blessing, simply cross your arms like so, and you will receive one. There's a basin for the cups that have been used. They can be rinsed later on the radiator. You'll go up the side here, and then cut across through the middle. And for those who might have challenges getting up front, please just let us know, we will come to you. So now all of that said, walk in love as Christ loves all of us.
gracious God. In your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we have fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and creator of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After his supper, he took the cup of wine. He said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption of God in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life to him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity constancy and peace, and at the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son and Jesus Christ, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal, formed of the earth, as the earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust. Yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servants with your saints. For your sorrow and pain are no more. I your sign of the life of the dust. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Deborah. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in life. Amen. Amen. Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love and make haste to be kind. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God and Mother of us all, be upon you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
I hope they say the same kind of nice things about me. I don't oh. think it's going to be there. I am five down, five up. Well, you're five, yeah, five up. Now. Five up. Yep. Yeah, five, five. That's why I'm so well adjusted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, we just did it. Really